Good morning, Redeemer. You guys good? We are going to get going. Let's stand and worship together. God, so we should worship greatly. No song is too loud, no orchestra too stately to hail the majesty of our King. So lift your voice as loud as we sing. God, so let our songs be endless. So awesome His ways, how could we comprehend them? So we will make it known to our kids, and we will sing about the gracious gifts you cannot contain it. We sing from our souls, affected by His greatness. His mercy covers all that He's made, showing His glory and His grace. Keep standing, keep standing, keep standing. We're going to do this really fast. Call to worship. A call to worship is us being informed by God's word to come into his presence. And so let's say this together. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people and he has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Let's continue in song. We long for Egypt in the wilderness, a kingdom made of dust. Built a night out of happiness, a paradise of rest. We lost all the meaning, drowned out the feeling, our hearts barely beating. Restore us again, God of our salvation. Revive us again in your unfailing love. Restore us again, God of our salvation. Revive us again in your unfailing love. We have trusted in the meaningless and chased the life. 
life of ease Now we wander in the shadowlands Where comfort is our king We lost all the meaning Drowned out the feeling Our hearts barely beating Restore us again God of our salvation Revive us again In your unfailing love Restore us again God of our salvation Revive us again
Father God, um, we just thank you today that even though um, we're wandering in the wilderness where we've uh, embraced the life of ease and comfort and um, we've made other kings instead of you, God, we, we praise you that um, you have been holding us fast so long um, that you sent your son um, for us so that you could hold us fast forever. Um, God, we thank you for uh, your enduring love. Let me pray this in your name. Amen. Let's take a moment, say hi to your neighbor, and we'll get back to singing in like one minute. All come back and sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above. since I've been here in the podium and I'm Chris McCurdy and I'm wondering if my peeps in the balcony remember what I mean when I say class class whoa everybody joined in thank you very much thank you you can wrap up those important conversations and have a seat if you'd like we have a lot of announcements this morning 
Right now, if you are a child between the ages of three through five, you are dismissed to go to Children's Church, and you can meet your teacher at the doorway here, and they will take you out to the back. If your child attends Children's Church this morning, you need to go retrieve them at the end of church in the back at the uh, portable so that um, their teachers can hold all the other students while you're, they're waiting for you. They don't come back to the church. So little kiddos, have a great time. All right. I'm Chris McCurdy, and um, I often forget to introduce myself, and I'm often known, I also am known, I go by Kenan's mom, so I answer to both. Um, you can scan the QR code in front of you on your uh, pew, and uh, we also have included the code on the online, um, announce, it's on online, so if you're at home watching, you can scan it as well with your phone, open your camera, point it at the QR code, the uh, link for the announcements pops up, and you can get all the announcements and more that I'm talking about. Um, we're very excited to announce the elder nominations begin January 30th, and they run through February. All the details were sent through the email, and questions can be directed to our current elders at elders at re welcome to redeemer.com. That's also in the announcements, um, that the link to that um, email address. Um, we ask for prayers for the process, and that's very important. Sola Fide is a homeschool group with families from our sister churches that in Lincoln. You are invited to the February meeting to see if you'd like to join. And you may contact Courtney Erdman um, for details. And Courtney is located up in the balcony today uh, in the upper right. She's over, over there if you'd like to talk to her today after church. Um, youth group this Wednesday. So is women's Bible study. Uh, the women are starting a study on Luke and would love to have you join them. There's also a group studying Luke on Sunday, on Saturday mornings, if that time works better for you. Saturday mornings, not Sunday mornings. For children that would like to become communing members on February 20th and the 27th, there's time for them to come meet with the elders from 9.30 to 10.30 here at the church. Please contact the elders if you want more information. Impossible prayer requests, because we believe in an impossible God. Will be taken through January, end of January. And we encourage you to share yours so the elders can pray with you this year. Let's hope and see what the Lord can do. Finally, there is a women's retreat coming up on March 5th. Save the date. Uh, apparently, Dawn is excited about this, and I think uh, others should be too. So save the date. Um, it's time for the offering, and I pray that uh, we would give freely of all that God has blessed us with and with thankful hearts. I encourage people that are um, watching uh, remotely and those of us who are here, you may uh, also give online. There are instructions for how to do so um, on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Kenan's mom, Chris. Uh, my name's Matt Odom, and I'm one of the pastors here at Redeemer. And uh, we're going to start a new sermon series through the Ten Commandments today. And we're going to give uh, the context for that series through uh, Exodus 19. 
And the, the text that you have in your liturgy on the QR code or what you see up here, we're actually only going to go through verse 6 uh, this morning. And so this is God's word to you today. It says this, On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they set out from Rephidim, and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness there, Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel. And these are the two verses we're mainly going to focus on. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So it's our practice here to spend some moments in silence before I uh, preach. And what we're doing in that space is remembering that God's present here with us. And that's so easy to forget. It's very easy to speak about God and forget that we're actually engaging with Him in this exact moment. And so that's very important. God gives us instruction. He speaks tenderly and affectionately to us at all times. And so when we pray in that moment of silence, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to come and and teach teach us that that's actually true. Um, And so would you do that with me right now? Father, we come yet again to your word, and uh, there are so many things going on in the life of each individual story, even within this room, and we're just one tiny part of our city, and our city is one tiny part of the entire globe, and Lord, our world is hurting, our world is hurting from so many things. And yet you are timeless in how you speak into each age, that you give instruction that is both objective and also practical for each people, for each age of human existence. And so, Lord, uh, that's what we want to tap into today. We want to engage with you. We don't want to just speak about you, but we want you to speak to us. And we trust that you can. And so would you do that now, by the Spirit, in Christ's name, amen. So, we are uh, starting a new series. We're going to talk about the context of God's law today. And maybe more than anything I've heard holistically over the past couple of years is that people are longing, myself included, we're longing for direction and guidance a longing for guidance in the midst of tumultuous times. If I hear the word unprecedented one more time, you know, over the past couple of years, but that's uh, showing like is it this stirring of the human heart holistically. And I just want us to all recognize, like we're all clearly going through something. And we have been over the past couple of years, something that's unearthing, something that's uh, challenging, No matter your background, your age, what part of the globe you're on, your economic status, we're all in it together. And many of us have seen uh, the failures of leaders over the past couple of years. And the reason why is because we are also unsure of the future. And there are so many question marks. And the reason why is because nothing is certain about anything right now. I, uh, I was in another part of the country, and I heard a, another pastor say that his friend had, took him out to coffee, and he really wanted to know what he thought about something. And at one point o- over coffee, uh, he, was, he was pointing at him, and this was like an old-time friend, but he was also his pastor, and he, and he said, I know, and I'm going to leave the name of this radio person uh, blank, so that just because I think that's wise. But he said, I know what my radio guy thinks about this, but I don't even know what my friend and pastor thinks about blank. And uh, my pastor friend said, 
No, you do know. We just disagree. And, you know, the one thing that's clear that, that we're all experiencing nationally, globally in this church is this deep, deep sense of, of loss, of fracturing, of division, exhaustion, and confusion. Um, this is where the people of God are situated in the book of Exodus. During a very... Uh, large shifts of evolving uh, shifts within the life of a community. And in the midst of that, Moses is given the law. He's given uh, instruction from God to give to the people. And the law, I do, I do want us to begin to embody and imagine what it would have been like to have been in the wilderness as a Jewish person. The law was way more than instruction. It really did. It encapsulated what a human being was supposed to be and do for, for the flourishing of a person and how they were to relate to God on an individual and societal level. In Psalm 119, uh, the, it's this epic song about how perfect and beautiful the law is. And I shared this with the prayer group this morning, but in verse 23 and 24, this is what Psalm 119 says. Even though really important people like princes or what we would say today, like presidents, sit plotting against me, uh, your testimonies, in the midst of that, in the midst of tumultuous times, your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors, the law. Now, um, anybody tried to reach out to a counselor over the past couple of years? Uh, they're all booked up. <laughs> Uh, and the reason why is because human beings desperately need to be heard and guided and loved and told how to live, what's good, and what's wise. That's what we need. We're sheep. I mean, sheep are dumb, you know, and that's okay. What, what if there was a timeless instruction in each age of human existence that spoke in a practical way that was discernible to our time, but it was also transcendent, it was objective, it was not biased to a particular time and a particular place. It could speak objectively, and yet it was knowable. This is how the Bible speaks about the law. The covenant is what it calls it. And we're going to walk through the Ten Commandments of the course of this season in the life of Redeemer. Uh, and we're going to take a look today at the context of the law because it's very, very important to know the context of the law. And we're going to see three things about the context. The law is rooted in story. The law flows from relationship. And the law gives you work to do. It tells you to practice things in this world. So point one, the law is rooted in story. I want you to take a look at verse four, and I want you to see how God is rooting the Israelites uh, in their story before giving them instruction. And he tells Moses to say, you yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, there's so much in that verse that we really could spend all day and, and talk about it. But what's going on there is that God defeated the Israelites' enemy, which was Pharaoh, the king, the monarch that enslaved them for a long time. He set them free through a bunch of water. And he mightily brought them through the desert on eagle's wings, is what it says, for a purpose, that there was an end goal in mind, and the purpose was to commune with him, to worship him, to be with him. That God brought all that about so that people could be with him and that they could enjoy each other. So, I want you to imagine this. For 430 years, all the Israelites had known was slavery. You know, think like six generations, slavery. They've been free in our passage for three months. Three. Um, they would have what we would call like neurological pathways in the brain where they would be more comfortable of thinking themselves, thinking of themselves as oppressed as opposed to free. Right? For generations. 
Look, I grew up in, uh, in Augusta, Georgia. My dad tells me this story, and I confirmed it yesterday. In the 60s, he was riding around in a truck with an African-American man who was tending to his granny's grave, is what they were doing. And on the way, he said, hey, white boy, do you want to bend down so that you don't have to be seen in a truck with a black man? Now, that's 100 years removed from slavery in our country. That that affects the way that people think about themselves to be a slave, even generations removed. You guys know, like let's say your grandparent, your grandfather was abusive to your dad, how that can dramatically shape and affect the way that you are with your family. That these patterns, these ruts that we get in are deep. Now think about, think about the text. How is God going to get his people to think differently about themselves? Verse 4. I beat the thing that you've always been afraid of, your oppressor. I beat him. I'm sufficient, and I like you. The thing that you have been uh, under for your entire life, on into generations in the past, I did away with it. And I did it in a cool way. I brought you on eagle's wings for the purpose of you being with me, of me speaking my love over you, of communion. God is in the business of reshaping who we think we are constantly. And he can do it. But he always does it indirectly. Uh, that's why if you've ever sat down with a counselor, you know, let's say you can't seem to quit punching through a wall. you got anger issues. Um, and you sit, you sit down with the counselor. What's the counselor going to say? The counselor is going to say, why don't you tell me what your upbringing was like? You know? And typically that person's like, well, don't, you're just going to psychoanalyze me? And the therapist is going to say, well, maybe. But your behavior didn't just come to be in a vacuum. There was an environment in which you thought it was normal to punch through a wall or that was your response to whatever you were experiencing. What is that counselor doing? That counselor is rooting your behavior in a story. That's what God wants to do. Before he tells you what to do, before he tells you how to live, he wants to root you in the story of redemption, which you have here in each of your individual lives and in the collective body that is Redeemer. He's rooting what Moses is doing, God's doing through Moses, is that he's rooting their behavior in the story. God wants to root the behavior of the law of his people in the fact that he likes to rescue people, that he's sufficient, and that he likes you, that he's endeared towards you. All God's rules flow out of that great love story. That he is strong, sufficient, and steadfast in his love. And so that's the first point, that the law is rooted in story. The second is that the law flows from relationship. And uh, it's very easy, you know, as modern people in the West, we just kind of assume that the divine would want to relate to us on a personal level. That was not assumed in the ancient world. That was strange. It was weird. And so there are these things called suzerain treaties back in the day where a strong king would beat a weak king, and then the strong king would list out on one side of a tablet, you do all this stuff, weak king, and if you don't, you're going to be my slave. Or if you don't, I'm going to kill you. Um, that was called a suzerain treaty. And, and what God does in the midst of that is that he speaks into that pattern and says, I'm going to actually write you a treaty, people of Israel, but it's going to be very different. And the way it's going to be different is that I want to relate to you on a personal level. I don't just want you to do what I say because of outward conformity, but I want to know you and I want you to know me. So much so that, I mean, it was bizarre that God would get his hands dirty with creation, like in Genesis 2, and when he creates Adam, it's mouth to mouth. 
that a God would get that close to creation. But he does. And he says in verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. We've talked about this before. But that word, treasured possession, it's segula in the Hebrew, but it's like a pet name. It's God cooing over Israel, calling Israel beautiful, calling Israel his little darling. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that movie, uh, A Beautiful Boy, Steve Carell. He plays the uh, father of a drug addict. The drug addict is played by Timothy Chalamet. But there's this one part in the, in the movie, you know, Timothy Chalamet just, he can't get off drugs, and, and Steve Carell starts singing over him, and he just says, you're my, you're my beautiful boy. But he can't help himself. That's how God relates to people. Um, you see it in, in the book of Hosea. Even when people are sexually scandalous, it says God, God's like, my heart recoils, and I can't stay mad at you. That that's his instinct towards you and towards me and towards Israel. That we are his treasured possession. Uh, does that sound too good to be true? And if you have a hard time believing that that's how God relates to you, um, why does it kill us when like, our parents are disappointed in us? Or why, if somebody of importance is like, if they compliment us, why does it make us feel like a million bucks? And I, I've used this example before, but and my buddy was in a low spot when he heard this, but I have a friend once. He was walking into his apartment complex, and there is this woman on the second floor of the apartment complex, like hanging over the rail, looking at him as he was walking in. And uh, she just said, hey, you look really good in blue. And he said, I went into my apartment, and I thought about it for three hours. Now, why? It's because you and I are encoded for somebody to look at us and say, well done, well done. I like you. You are my treasured possession. You are made for it. That's how God wants to relate to you. To give you his divine smile. This is what God is constantly showing us in Jesus. You know, the more I think about Jesus' baptism, there is so much there. Um, but there is this phrase that God used when he was baptized. He's, he said, this, this is my son. You, you guys can probably finish it. This is my son with whom what? I am well pleased. You know, when you're baptized, that's what you're baptized into, to the, into the pleasure of God. Through Christ. When we think of obeying God's rules and his law, we, we often miss that obedience to God's ways, keeping the covenant, um, is only possible from the heart. You do know that, right? Like outward conformity in your behavior without the heart is actually what God hates because it's a mask of what's true. That's what Jesus is going to teach us in the Sermon on the Mount, that this is what it looks like to have instincts towards God internally, not just to do what's right on the outside. And he's showing us what the embodiment of the law looks like in a fallen world and how to live it out. Jesus himself says on the Sermon on the Mount, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. I came to live it out. I, I didn't come to loosen it or relax it. And here's where this, you know, this throws a lot of people into confusion about Christianity because you may even have a question like, okay, this is a Christian church. Why are we like looking at the Jewish law? And the reason why is because Jesus was the embodiment of that law and we are called to live in light of the moral law still. That this is good for human flourishing that this is the embodiment of what human beings are supposed to be in, in this world. And our problem today, with many of us, is that we think any sort of conformity 
to an outside entity or any sort of conformity that like pushes against my will is unwise for a person. And, and so we don't tell our friends about the hard things that are in the Bible <laughs> because it's going to be offensive. Um, but you guys know this. It, if you want to learn how to do something, um, there, is challenge, there are challenges involved. There's pain at stake. And so, you know, there's this one writer named Dallas Willard. He says, you have to think of becoming... Um, a follower of God by in, in the way that like you're an apprentice, you're a, an apprentice of Jesus. You're learning the motions and rhythms of, of what it means to follow our good shepherd. And one of the great things about Christianity is that you won't ever feel God's affection, really, this love that God has for you, unless you begin to live life the way that he's designed for you to live it. And when you do, it's like, it's like drinking fresh water when you're dehydrated. The freest player on the field is the one who knows the rules so well that they don't even have to think about them. They stay within the rules. And so the question for us is, do you want to learn how to be God's image in the world? And that requires trust. Um... One pastor gave this illustration uh, a while back, and I'll never forget it, but he said, um, <coughs> you know, when Mr. Miyagi was, uh, do kids still know about Karate Kid today? Mr. Miyagi, Daniel? Uh, there we go. Amen. I, yeah, I hear that. Um, when Mr. Miyagi was teaching Daniel how to, how to fight, what did he do? He took him to his car, and he said, wax the car, wax on, wax off. And Daniel was like, what? This doesn't have anything to do with fighting. And Mr. Miyagi said, trust me. He was learning the the motions and rhythms, but he did it in a way that didn't make sense to him at first, which was very important because it required trust of the master. And Jesus wants to be your master. But he's going to ask you to do things that don't make sense to you at first. And that's intentional. Much of the law is not going to make a lot of sense at first, but God's training you to learn the rhythms and instincts of what it means to love him. And so the law gives us work to do. Verses 5 and 6, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so in the last part of that verse, the the two main ways that God instructs people to live is that we are to love neighbor and love him. The first four commandments and ten commandments have to do with our relation to God, our love of God. And the last six deal with how we relate to one another. And uh, that's what we see as a summary in that verse. So kingdom of priests is how we are to relate to other human beings. And the point is, and we don't have a ton of time to get into this, but Israelites were meant to be an avenue by which the other pagan peoples got into contact with God, meaning Israel existed for the sake of other people. That they existed as conduits by which people came into contact with God, portals. Now, what does that mean for you? It means that You, even if you don't believe in God, this is your design, you exist to show people who God is, to bring people near to God, that you are most free when that happens, that a human being is most full when they draw people into God's presence. Now, how do we do that? Through not killing each other, through honoring our parents, through not lying or stealing or coveting. Jesus is going to show us how to do that when he comes on the scene from the heart. But he shows us, this is what Jesus is doing, he's showing us how to relate to our neighbor as carefully and lovingly as we relate to ourselves, which is hard work. Second aspect of the work that God has called the Israelites and consequently us to do is to be a holy nation. Now, more on this coming in the few in the next weeks, but... Holiness means to exist yourself within the presence of God. And the challenge 
with existing in the presence of God is that God consumes all things that hinder us from operating against our design, i.e. sin. And so when you get near to God, what begins to happen is that He makes you do business with Him from the heart. He makes you hone in on that area of your heart where you're hating other people and where you're hating Him. And He wants to shine a light on that not so that he can make you feel guilty, but so that he can draw you into who you actually are, his image. And at some point, this is how you know it's beginning to happen in your life. At some point, you're going to say, I'm obeying God. I'm following the Ten Commandments because I actually want to. I'm following the Ten Commandments because like this is the good, like this is the bucket list. That's when you know that God's got you. That the Christian is one when no one's looking. Because they want to be. So how do you get there? And uh, how do you know if you're heading in the right direction? And I want to give three uh, very practical examples, and we're going to close today. I think the first and maybe biggest one, (coughs) that you know God's got you, is if you learn to receive suffering. You don't have to like suffering. But what suffering can do, if you know this God, is that it can draw you closer and closer and closer and closer to Him. And here's how you know if you're heading in the, right, the wrong direction, is if suffering makes you more and more and more bitter. Charles Spurgeon said, I've learned to kiss the wave that knocks me against the rock of ages. And what that means practically is that, let's say something comes into your life that you don't want there, that you know is going to be hard, um, that you begin, this is how it starts, you begin to observe it instead of just asking for it to go away immediately. You observe it. And you ask God, what, what are you doing here? Second, um, do you fi- how do you do the work that God's called us to do? Are you finding yourself dreaming and meditating on the good of other people or more on their bad? When you meditate about other people, do, does what comes... Does what comes to mind oftentimes, is it their flaws? Or do you imagine how God sees them? Love of neighbor means that you you control your mind to dwell on the good of another person, especially when they hurt you. To bless when others curse. And third, how do you do the work of God? I'm going to tell you something that I do, very practical. You don't have to do it. I'm just telling you what I do, just to kind of get some hooks, you know, on something you can hang your hat on. Uh, I have trouble sleeping. When I can't sleep at night, um, I listen to the Bible. And Christine Getty, I think she reads the ESV. She talks Irish. Um, Psalm 1 says that if you meditate on the law during the day and the night, you become like a tree that's firmly planted by streams of water. Uh, Your spiritual rhythms of reliance on God, it takes work. It's hard. Uh, But God delights to train us. He delights in it. Look, if Steph Curry offered to give me a three-point shooting lesson, and spend an hour with me. I'd take him up on it. Um, The law and Jesus as the goat of human beings is perfect, and he wants to train you. We're not justified by the law, but it's how we exercise our true gifts and our freedom as image bearers in this world. 
And so go to him. It's here. It's always available. Um, the law is rooted in story. It flows from relationship, and it gives you work to do. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for uh, your son Jesus, and as we think about the instructions that you've gi given to us, Lord, help us to see them not as restrictive, um, but as the way in which we feel and experience freedom and joy. And Lord, um, as we see Jesus as the embodiment of that in this world, that you would unite us to him, that you would connect us to him, um, and that we would hear that deep fatherly voice of your pleasure over us at all times because of him. And so as we confess sin, as we come to this table, and as we sing, um, help us to exist within that delight. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I think of that uh, verse in Romans that talks about uh, it's God's kindness that leads us into repentance. Um, when we look at all the, if you just look at the commands without the preamble to it, the fact that God went to great lengths uh, to, uh, to come where our people were. Uh, they were sitting in darkness and chaos, and, and God spoke into that. Um, and, it's, and it describes him as coming and lifting them out and putting them on eagles. And, um, of course, that's just language to help describe just how amazing it is that God would not leave us as our sins desire or as our sins um, would have us, but that he would enter in. Uh, repentance is a way um, that the Christian responds to relinquish control and then to set our hearts on the way of human flourishing, which means synced into the spirit that Christ gives us. And so we're going to say our confession. This is a way that we get to do this, a small way. Um, but to remember that it's his kindness that's bringing us here. So don't stay in the dark, you know. Um, holding yourself hostile or hostage, but rather allow your hearts to be aligned with his in this confession. So let's confess our sin together and then we'll hear his assurance. Confession, confession of sin. Lord, though you should guide us, we inform ourselves. Though you should rule us, we control ourselves. Though you should fulfill us, we console ourselves. We think your truth too high, your will too hard, your power too remote, your love too free, but they are not. And without them, we are all people most miserable. Now heal our confused minds with your word. Heal our divided wills with your law. Heal our troubled consciences with your love. Heal our anxious hearts with your presence. All for the sake of your son who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. Now take a moment and pray silently, confessing to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Hear these prayers. Lord, we have uh, chosen to take control, uh, many of us in this room, because of all the uncertainty. We have chosen to trust in ourselves, or as the uh, Proverbs say, in, in chariots, or whatever that we think will bring life and will guide us into better ways or to help us escape. And we want to uh, let that loose in your kindness. It, it's kindness for you to not just leave us as our sins deserve, but rather you awaken us to a better way, the way of human flourishing. And so in this moment, we confess, we pray that you do hear even our feeble attempts at, at confessing <laughs> and our, um, yeah, being sheep, needing guidance. Pray that you'd hear us. In Christ's name, amen.
Friends, lift up your heads and hear these words of assurance coming from Romans 7, 21 through 25. Listen as I read. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Amen. Amen. She can see to read one of those Bible apps. Man, I'd love to like hear you. Um, you know, I, one of the things I love about this table is that there's a, there's a particular clarity that comes through the sacraments at baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, I was talking with, with Trudy Soper. Trudy Soper lost her mother, Charlene Worth, and that's what these flowers are um, in honor of, Charlene. But Trudy was talking about how when, you, when somebody passes, you wish you had more time with them. You wish that you had these moments in the past back where you could kind of really appreciate it. And I do think that there is something to the sacraments that allow us to be present in a moment um, that unites both past and future right here through Christ. And I do think in some ways that's what Jesus speaks about when he says eternal life. It's not just about duration, but it's about a quality of a moment that is eternal. Um, and so whatever is unclear in the service in terms of the gospel, it becomes clarified here that you have a God who sacrificed for you, bled, body broken. Um, and the reason why he did that is because he loves you that he's endeared towards you, and that he wants you. And that that is what is to inform this community. That that gospel love is to infuse individuals and in spaces and times that we have. And this is our moment. And so if that's the story that you want to be involved in, that you want to be connected to, you really need to come to this table and to be nourished and to be reminded that, like, this is God's playbook, the law. You know, the moral law is good. Um, if that's not, if you don't want to have anything to do with Jesus, uh, we're glad you're here. And we want you to have something to do with Jesus. That's why we exist. And so uh, this is a part of the service where we would want you to take this table in faith. And so we would ask that you would observe and say, okay, what would it look like if I started to believe in Jesus? And at that point, we would want you to come to the table. Uh, there's no judgment uh, here among anybody if you decide to sit, sit out. And so um, our practice here is to come up in two rows. Pastor Steve will be on this side. I'll be on this side. The outer ring is grape juice. The inner rings are um, wine. Thank you, Don Marie. And... Uh, I'm going to set the elements apart, pray, and then you guys are invited up after the musicians come. So let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for this meal. We set it apart for its special, special use. Uh, throughout the age, the ages of the church, Lord, you sanctify this meal as a sacrament. The elements remain what they are. They don't transform into your body and blood, but we trust that you are in some mysterious way spiritually present here with us letting us hold a moment with, with you that taps into our union with you and our eternal life. And so would you confirm that to your people um, through your love and that you would help us to know that the instructions that you give us are, um, they're so freeing and so good. They're better than gold. And so help us, Lord, uh, sustain us, comfort us. In Christ's name, amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Drink of it for the forgiveness of sins. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite you up.
Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. The great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me then steep When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within of what I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin because a sinless Savior died my sinful soul is counted free for God the justice satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this meal, this great meal of communion with you. And Lord, at your table, um, things become clear, and you are the God of your people, and we exist in uh, your Son under his blood, washed and bathed in pure righteousness. And so, Lord, help us to sing in that light. Thank you for all the gifts that you've given to your people. And we ask, Lord, that we would go out into this week uh, with healing, with um, sustenance, and with grace. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing the final song. Breathe in, refreshed, no more soil than the 
his grace I look up at him to whom I am kneeling and I see the light there in my father's face I'm a son of God and love is my freedom I can't ask anything of my father the king I'm an heir I'm adopted and my brother is Jesus I'm a son of God my soul is no longer to be right or good or to prove my own worth I'm not driven or pushed or weighed down with duty I am filled with release the Christ did all for me I'm a son of God and love is my freedom I can't my father the king i'm an heir i'm adopted and my brother is jesus i'm a son of god and my soul is at peace i stand up in faith because i fear no longer and i pray and wait for god to provide i lean on on him who is able and I set aside every effort of mine I'm a son of God and love is my freedom I can ask anything of my father the king I'm an heir I'm adopted and my brother is Jesus I'm a son to receive the benediction. And benediction just means good word. This is the good word that we go out into the world with. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in grace and peace.